Okay, so we're, I guess we're gonna talk about some of the African violet relatives that we can grow here in the garden in North Carolina uh, and some other places in the country. There's some different ones they can grow that we can't uh, and vice versa. But um, to get started, I'll just give you a very brief overview of the Jesneriaceae, which is the family that includes the African violets. Um, and they're not all from Africa. And it's, I always find it strange. And growing plants that I consider house plants outside here um, always seems strange too. But in reality, there are, um, there's, there's over 300 or 3,500 species of Jesneriaceae in the Jesneriaceae. So, and over um, about, or actually not over, but about 150 or so um, different genera. So there's a wide variety of plants spread out throughout mostly the tropics and subtropics, but there are actually temperate ones as well. And surprisingly, there aren't the ones that we grow here in reality most of the time with the temperate growing ones. Uh, we typically grow some of the subtropical ones here, which um, I truly find ironic. And being that some of the ones that we grow here are ones, their cousins are ones we actually uh, grow as houseplants. So if I'll, I'll do this uh, you know, question, has anybody grown a gloxinia? The florist gloxinia, great big bells of, um, that are an inch or so across and they might be red or purple or double and have a picotied edge of white. That is actually not a gloxinia. Uh, that's just the common name for that one. It's actually a, a, a syningia, which later on I'll show you a bunch of different syningias that we can actually grow here. So, and those are South American. There's, there's um, different uh, Jesneriads that are in Africa, of course, the African violet uh, and Streptoco which actually I think African violet used to be in St. Paulia. They're now lumping into another genus Streptocarpus, which we grow some of those as uh, house plants and some of them as summer annuals in reality, although they're great perennials for as a pot plant in the house. Um, and then there's other ones, uh, uh, a lot of them from Southeast Asia, which we grow some of those here. Um, and uh, then there's actually some that come up into Europe. None of them are in, uh, in North, uh, the United States, uh, but the ones in Europe tend to actually be at high elevations. And I don't have good luck with those in the garden, though there's actually one right over here, which I'm not gonna even talk about too much, but I might mention, um, which I think it's Greek. And there's some other um, close relatives of this one that they grow up into zone five anyways, even maybe zone four. So there's a wide diversity of plants from tropical to temperate um, that in this family, it's really uh, diverse. And there's crazy hybrids with them. They're like, kind of like orchids of the, um, um, uh, when it comes to crossing, you can cr do some really strange crosses with them, which I really don't have any of those here, but um, I do have some strange plants to show you and I find them uh, really interesting. So um, I'll start off with, um, we're gonna do some of the plants from South, Central and South America actually, because there's a bunch of those that have done really well here. Um, and I'll touch on probably just two or three genera that I can think of offhand, uh, probably just two uh, genera in particular, but, um, uh, the first being the syningias, which I mentioned the florist gloxinias a few minutes ago. And those are probably the, um, some of the most commonly grown because there's a pot plant. They grow, you tend to throw them out. They'll form a, a tuber though that you can save. That, there are forms of gloxinia, the florist gloxinia, which is actually syningia speciosa. So the genus syningia, which there's, I just looked this one up, I had to look. There's about 65 species of syningias. Uh, and we can grow uh, that, a bunch of those as well as their hybrids. Um, and anyways, the Floris Gloxinia, I don't have any pictures of it. Or wait, I, I do. Do I have a picture of Syningia? No, I don't. I didn't put it in there. But Syningia speciosa carangola is a selection that is sometimes grown in this area. I don't have that in the garden right now. But uh, it's a really cool one. It has a a white edge fading to, uh, through purple to almost a black purple in the center. And the flowers are a good inch or so across. Um, really spectacular. But there's a bunch of other ones that um, do very well here. Synergia speciosa, it's borderline. We can keep it a few years occasionally here before it fizzles out. But there's some that we've had tried and true in the garden for years now. And those are some of the syningias that are primarily hybrids with um, Syningia solovii, which I have one right here in a pot, um, which is kind of a coral color. And I think 
um, I have a picture of a close-up of the flower as well that um, um, uh, Blake has on the computer that he may bring up at some point. But anyways, um, these are really cool plants. They're the best ones for us. These will take sun for us, full sun, well-drained soils. That might be the problem there, but they'll take the heat of our summer. They only flower for a few weeks, you know, starting in late May, early June, and they'll have flowers on them. Um, main flow, uh, show is June, but then we'll have, they'll have flowers on them at least till frost. Um, and this is just a, a really easy going plant. Tubers on these get great big, and I'll show you a small tuber actually of a, of a hybrid, but this is a hybrid with Silovii that we have in the garden um, that I had in the nursery that I, I unpotted, but this is just about a year old cutting. So, um, and it was had no special care, it's been tortured. So uh, <laughs> this is what happens to a tortured plant. If you put this in the garden, you can literally get a tuber the size of your head. Uh, <laughs> but they will come up from this in the spring. Uh, this is one called Bananas Foster, which I don't know if I have a picture on there or not, but I do have a stem here. And let's see if I can get this showing up for you. It's a soft yellow with pink hints. And the, when it cools off in the fall, it does take even more pins, uh, pink hints in it. But the plant on this in the garden gets about three to four feet tall. Uh, and the flower spikes, these are late flower spikes, but the early flower spikes might be 24 inch, uh, 20 to 24 inches long, sticking out from these three to four foot tall plants arching out. Um, and there are these tubular flowers. So what do you think pollinates tubular flowers in the wild? Hummingbirds. Yes, hummingbirds. Um, uh, many of the species, as you saw in the, the Syningia slovii, are reddish or coral colored, as this is sometimes called uh, hardy gloxinia or coral gloxinia, I think maybe are some of the common names for it. But um, this bananas foster is a hybrid of slovii with another one, which I don't remember. I didn't get a chance to look it up. It might be aggregata or something, but uh, flowers the entire summer, like I said, easygoing plants. Um, but these tubers that you see right here allow this to get through our winters. Um, you can grow these in pots too. I have a one that sits on my uh, the balcony in my in my apartment. I don't have a garden at home. I have uh, I have an, a balcony, but I have it in the pot. I throw the pot in my storage room uh, where my hot water tank is through the winter months. Dries a bone, get it out in the spring, start watering it. Comes right back up. But the same uh, thing that allows me to do that allows you to grow this in the garden. These plants will go totally dormant through our winters and uh, sleep through the cold and they will pop right back up in the spring with no problem at all. So um, really great plants there. And there's a wide variety of Syningia hybrids. Um, I don't have the other common species, um, or I didn't put a picture in there, I should have, but um, Syningia tubiflora is another really common one. And that, uh, the tubiflora and the Silovii are the two predominant species I see that are used in these hybrids with other things, and they give them the great hardiness. Um, so I have a couple, let's say I have another um, uh, Silovii hybrid here. Um, and this is one uh, called Scarlet O'Hara. I don't know if you can see that against my shirt here. Um, it's a little bit longer and it's a little rosier than the, um, the straight species Slovii, but it's been a wonderful plant for us. We've had it in the garden probably for 10 or 12 years now, let me think, probably in that range. Same with the Bananas Foster. Um, and it, they do perfectly fine uh, to grow those. Um, and I already showed you the Bananas Foster. So going into those hybrids, which I said about with um, uh, uh, tubiflora, which is a pure white, uh, lemon scented, wonderfully lemon scented uh, flowers in the evening. It's probably moth pollinated in the wild. Uh, it has a really long floral tube and you'll see how that long, it's like actually three inches or so, uh, you'll see how that transfers into these hybrids. Um, and this is um, two different ones here, they actually look very similar at this stage, but uh, if you had seen them in the garden, they are quite different. Uh, the one that I'm, uh, let's see, I'll put in front of me now, is one called Lovely. Um, and it's lightly fragrant, even right now, but in the evening it has even better fragrance. This one gets to about two feet tall, um, and it's been, again, flowering since late May, early June. Um, with the, that's when it has its heaviest flowering, and then it's 
that you get a good flowering, especially if you deadhead a little bit even, um, it'll flower the rest of the summer until frost. And lightly fragrant, and again, you can see these floral tubes. These are ideal for hummingbirds or some certain moths. So um, a great pollinator plant for us. And uh, tuba flora has a tendency, it makes little potatoes everywhere. You can almost use it as a ground cover. It will spread out over three or four foot patch, but only be the foliage will only be six inches tall on it. And the flowers are up on tall scapes about a foot or so above it. Um, these plants are much more compact. They have some, I think one of them may have Solovii as its parent, and the other has another parent, but I don't remember which one and uh, the stories behind them right now. But either way, um, they're very fragrant for us and just a great garden plant form. Um, after a couple of years, you get about a two and a half to three foot wide clump of them. Um, they sucker lightly, but not aggressively. Uh, and they're, again, very drought tolerant. If we have terribly dry periods, they can go dormant, doesn't matter. But if you keep them a little bit of water, they stay up and growing the entire summer uh, and, and happy as a clam. And so this, the second one, look, you probably think it's the same one, but this is Arkansas Bells. It was out of a different bro breeding program. Um, but again, it has a tubiflora hybrid. Uh, it's a little more upright in fluorescence to me than um, that of the lovely. Um, and there's another one that we used to have called, I think it was Carolyn, uh, which looked very similar. It's a similar hybrid. But um, and right now, I can't pick up the fragrance on this one yet, but I'm guessing in the evening, a lot of times these fragrances will intensify a bit because of that nocturnal fragrance of their parent, one parent uh, tuba flora. Uh, so that I think, oh. I didn't uh, cover one last syningia here. And this is one we've been playing around with for a few years now. We got it in a seed and it's like Mark got it from three or four places. Like, why Mark? We've gotten a seed from three places two, a couple of years in a row. And I don't think it's gonna be hardy. Well, it surprised us. We planted some of these out. Actually, if you come to our pedestrian entrance, these have been in the pedestrian entrance since at least 2019, maybe 2018. I didn't look in the records, but this is one, um, that has really surprised me. It's Syningia eumorpha. And if you come in the gate right now, this was in the greenhouse, but you'll see the same thing flowering perfectly uh, um, in front of the, uh, along the, the sidewalk there on the west side of the sidewalk as you walk in the pedestrian entrance. Um, I don't think this one's fragrant. I can't uh, smell anything. There's another species very similar to this. I, can, I think it's Conspicua that has a wonderful lemon fragrance as well. And there's been hybrids with that. And, um, and they get, uh, it gets about a foot or so tall on the hybrids with Conspicua, but this one only gets about six to eight inches tall. Um, it'll grow again as a pot plant. This has a great big tuber in it. Um, I don't think you can see it in there, but it's pushing that pot out. It's pushing up out of the pot. So it, um, but in this thing here, but they get a little bit bigger than this. This one's a little hungry being in the pot too, but a uh, really great plant for us. And like I said, it's been through at least uh, three winters now in the garden, if not four. So it's, it's proven to be way hardier than I ever expected. Uh, and it's a beautiful one. And there are some hybrids that they've made with this species as well. So uh, I look forward to trying some other ones. Hey, Tim, yep. do you know if these are deer resistant? I have not had any rabbits eat them. <laughs> which is even more of a miracle. So I don't know about deer, but rabbits have not touched them. And that says something because the rabbits always eat anything and everything in the garden. I've never come in here and found one of these uh, snipped off. So, And can you give people at home some ideas about where they can acquire some of these plants? Uh, some of the hybrids of the Solovii and Tubiflora um, Plant Delights um, Nursery offers those. Um, there, if you look online, though, you can find a lot of Jesneriad company, uh, African Violet companies. They'll, if you do online, you'll find all kinds of Jesneriads. Uh, and you can find Solovii and Tubiflora, if nothing else, online, too. Uh, you can find some other ones that we haven't tested or tried. Uh, so um, they're out there, mm. and they're actually widely available. They're really easy to propagate, too. Uh, stem cuttings uh, on the, uh, the ones that have stems like this Syningia Solovii super easy. Um, this Eumorpha doesn't have much of a stem. It, you can uh, grow this one either from seed. You can also grow Slovii from seed uh, as well, the straight species, or leaf cuttings. So uh, just like you would an African violet. So they're, they're really easy. Um, the hybrids, um, uh, like uh, 
uh, Lovely and um, Arkansas Bells, and, um, Benny and his Foster, and uh, yeah, I have Scarlett O'Hara here. Those, you can either div divide them if you have an existing plant or cuttings again. Um, but they're relatively easy to acquire online uh, or like I said, especially nursery like uh, Plant Delights Nursery that we have locally uh, has several different ones. Um, can you let us know uh, how much shade can they take? The ones I've showed so far, yeah, um, we've. I haven't tried this one, the Eumorpha, I have not tried in sun. We grow this in shade. Um, but the Syningia solovii and Tubiflora and their hybrids, I grow those in full sun. Part shade, they, they do grow, but they're not as happy. They actually do want full sun. Uh, and and they'll, they don't have to be babied at all. And could you just name off which ones were fragrant? The, um, okay, so the species, which I didn't show you, is Tubiflora, Syningia Tubiflora. That one's super fragrant in the evening. It's a nocturnally pollinated one by moths. So that's when the, the, the fragrance is strongest. And of the two, of the ones I showed you here, um, definitely you should get good fragrance, probably from um, Lovely and Arkansas Bells. Uh, and if you can find one, I think it's called Carolyn, is another one, it's a similar, very similar hybrid. Those are all fragrant. Uh, and if, I think it's Conspicua was another species that we used to have super lily of the valley fragrance to it. Love that one, nice. but we lost that one. I used to have it in our scree garden. So they'll, they'll take our dry gardens as well. I, I have Solovii growing in a, our geophyte border with normal, I actually irrigate there, but we also have it in our scree garden and I've had it in both places for, oh, at least 15 years. Uh, so they're really resilient plants. So that covers Syningia. The another one that I'm going to talk about from South America are some of the Simanias, which used to be a genus that it, uh, was lumped into the genus Gloxinia. Uh, but they've done um, DNA work now and they've realized that they're totally different. They're, they do cross, actually. Like I said, with orchids, you can make these strange crosses. With Jesneriads, you can make these strange crosses, too. But um, this is one, so I don't have a, uh, a flower here. And I don't know if I put a picture of this up. Did I get uh, Evita, a picture of Evita by chance? Um, Simania nematozoides Evita? I might not have. But anyways, regardless if I didn't, um, it looks very similar in flower to one I do have a picture of on there. Simania uh, Little Red. And I think um, I may have put both a close-up yeah. and a, uh, a whole plant, I'm hoping, but I might not have. If not, I do have a piece of Little Red right next to me. Uh, which is wilted because I cut it and didn't put it in water. But the flowers on this look identical almost to what I have in this hand. This is um, Simania nematothoides. I can't spit that out. Evita. This is one that um, our friend uh, Tony Avent collected in the, I think in the 90s in Argentina. Hence Evita. That was when the movie Evita about Ava Perón was out. So he called it that. But they have um, a very different um, structure under the ground to me. And I don't know if we can, Lisa's is gonna try to get this for me. It, this is just a small one. This is from a cutting that I got in the nursery. It's a funky little, they get longer. They'll get an inch or so long. They look like caterpillars to me. They're these little scaly rhizomes. And that's how this uh, group survives our winters. They go dormant and have little rhizomes. If anybody's growing echemones, which there are some of those that are theoretically hardy here, I have not gotten them established in the garden, but there are a few of those that have been hardy here. They have very similar rhizomes to them. Um, and like I said, they just look like a little <laughs> inch or so long, I, I describe as a caterpillar. So um, anyways, you can may be able to see this, I don't know. Um, on camera, but also the Simanias form these rhizomes, uh, or I mean not rhizomes, stolons, which then form into rhizomes later on. So this is how it propagates itself. And this makes patches. Um, uh, this is a spectacular orange red. And like I said, this is a hybrid one here. Um, Simania is a relatively small genus. I couldn't find out specifics on it, but I think only maybe five to 10 species. And they're predominantly found in the northern, um, the Andes region of Northern and South America. But there's one species that ranges over into uh, Guyana, uh, French Guiana, and Brazil. And that is um, when it's borderline here, and I can't always keep it, is um, Simania 
purpurescence. And, but there's a hybrid that was made by a, a, actually a guy who works at Smithsonian who, who did, I think, the research to re-break up Simania from Gloxinium. I can't think of his name, but I've met him. Um, but anyways, he did this hybrid, uh, Little Red. It's not hardy for them in DC, but for us, Little Red has been great. It, I don't know if you can see it in this picture or in, or that is uh, on these, this sample I have or in the picture, but it has a more, much more pointed leaf uh, than that of Nematothoides. That flower is a little bit earlier than Nematothoides avita. Um, and the leaves are bigger, but they're, they have dark pigmentation to them. And it comes from the purpurescence. It's really pretty. You can probably see it here on the undersides of the leaf here. Um, it, it gives another aspect and a reason to grow this plant. Uh, but this gets taller than uh, Nematothoides evita. It gets about 15 inches tall. Well, um, the straight species purpurescence, it gets about two feet tall and Avita about eight to 10 inches tall. But they both spread, that is uh, little red and um, uh, nematothoides spread by these rhizomes, or these stoloniferous rhizomes, I guess you'd say, um, and, uh, and perpetuate themselves in our soils here. They come up quite late, typically not until, at the earliest, earliest would be late May, typically in June uh, is when we start to see growth on these again. But spectacular orange-red flowers, and again, you can probably guess what pollinates them, typically would be hummingbirds. So. But those have been really good for us. Evita has been in the garden for longer than I've been working here. Um, and that's over 16 years now. So it was planted, I think, in 2004 or 2005 in a bed out here. And it's still there. It does move about. It doesn't stay stationary. Um, and it's going to die in one place and come up in another. But it's not a weed or anything. It's, it's a, just a great little plant. Um, so those are a couple of the South American genera that have been really good for us. And I'm starting to run out of time. I need to get to my Asian stuff. Um, so anyways, we're going to go to one here. Uh, there are hemiboeids, which um, I think I have a picture of this one. This is hemiboea uh, subacolis in uh, Jingjiensis, I think is maybe how you spit out the species. Uh, or variety, it's hemiboea subacolis variety and Jengzi Bells is a cultivar they've put on this one. This is one that actually Mark and a fellow from the Atlanta Botanic Garden, I believe, collected just four or five years ago, anyways, before COVID. Um, and it's been doing excellent. It's a real late flowering species for us. Um, uh, but I think I have a picture there of the first flowers we had in our nursery. They aren't great pictures, but uh, they're some of the only ones we have in our collection right now. I need to get some better ones this fall when this comes into flower. But this gets about eight uh, to 10 inches tall. It forms clumps, uh, spreading clumps actually. Um, Hemoboeas are the stoloniferous um, Jesneriads from Southeast Asia. Um, I looked, they have a pretty wide distribution from the Himalayas the whole way over to Japan, down into Vietnam and Thailand, um, and over into Taiwan. Uh, so it's pretty wide distribution for the genus. And I believe Mark collected this one in China. Um, that really cool group of plants. Uh, I don't know if I put a picture of um, uh, Hemoboea um, subcapitata in there or not, but Later on, we might uh, be able to get you to show, uh, show you that. But those are flowering here in the Laugh House right now. It is super vigorous for us and forms a ground cover in the summer. And it has uh, white flowers, um, little tubular flowers. And they come in this little, um, these bracts that surround the buds. And my in, uh, one of my interns in 2020, actually, he had worked at, uh, as an intern in Missouri Botanic Garden and showed me that there's this really fun thing you can do with these, these uh, unexpanded uh, uh, inflorescence. They work like little squirt guns. <laughs> so uh, we, um, my interns come and pick them out and they, we squirt each other. Um, <clears throat> but it's always a fun one. But these are some really good low ground covers for the most part. Though there are some other ones which one of our volunteers, she had gotten one. Uh, which we have just planted over here and it hasn't flowered yet, but um, it's Hemoboea uh, af cavalarii. And uh, she says, mine's gotten three feet tall in a pot. Ours isn't that tall in the garden yet, but it was about this tall. And it's coming into bud for the first time. So I'm anxious to see what that does, but it, they have been hardy for us 
um, and just a, a cool group of plants. The sub, uh, sub capitata, we actually have, if you come to the uh, McSwain Center, there's one on the center rock growing. It's been up there for three years, growing on a rock in our cascade um, on one of the shelves there. So it's, uh, it's up there and it's done, it's been happy as a clam next to our water, but I grow them here in our lath house. They do, don't do want to dry out excessively, but they, um, they're, they're fine in an evenly moist soil and shade. It's a shade for, um, plant for us, not a sun plant. So I'll go with that one and I'm gonna go right behind me. I don't know if uh, Lise can get these or not, I'm hoping. This is another really um, cool Jesneriad here. This is Titanotrichum old hamii, the flowers are a kind of a burgundy on the inside and they're this butter yellow, melted margarine on the outside. Um, and they come in long sprays. They sometimes call them golden temple bells. Uh, from what I know, I think it's, a, a, I think I could be wrong. I think it's the only species in the genus, but I could be wrong on that. Um, and Mark has gone and tried to collect some of this and find some new ones. And I think he's told me that there's no variation. Um, it has a tendency, at least in the nursery, it'll, it'll flower and it'll form plantlets that fall off on the flower stalks. I think it propagates itself mostly asexually as, um, as little viviparous plants that grow all over it on the, the flower stalks. But and I've even had a few with the mild winters. There's a few coming up in the pathway in here. I actually sprayed some of them out, um, but um, it's, it forms a, a rhizome too and forms this big patch. There's, we took, we've taken, we've shrunk the patch behind me a couple times and we did some recently because it was eating up its neighbors. Um, but it is a wonderful flower plant. It starts in July, late July, early August, and it'll go till frost uh, with these wonderful yellow and um, burgundy flowers. So that's a, a good one there. And oh, quickly, i run running out of time, but this is one, it's another new one for me. Uh, we have one of these that was planted in the garden um, last fall. And I thought, Doug, well, I wouldn't plant that now. It's never gonna make it. Um, this is, I'm gonna mess up the murder of the name. Ascenanthus, it's, if anybody grows lipstick plant, which is a common uh, grown as um, Jesneriad as a houseplant. This is a species called Buxifolius. And I didn't find out too much about it, but this is from a collection that we got from um, the rhododendron species uh, garden in uh, just outside of Seattle. Uh, and they've been growing. And I thought this thing would never be hardy here. There's one just back here. It's only about oh, this tall, you know, four inches tall, but it has its first bud on it and it's red and it's gonna be a little lipstick plant flower. The, in the wild, these grow as epiphytes. So I'm guessing they get um, some fair amount of chill to them. So in reality, I guess they don't protect, the root system's not protected, but these plants are evergreen. Um, and I think being, we grow it as a gr in the ground, not as an epiphyte, it, it's happy as it, it's happy here. So I'm really uh, interested to see how this does. We've got down to about 15 this year. So um, if we have a colder winter, which I hope not too many, um, Maybe we'll see truly how hardy it is, but it was unfazed this winter. So, and I think, let's see, what else do I have? Um, there's a bunch of other um, rosette forming species and genera, which um, we are just starting to get into, but they don't flower for as long as some of these others or have as much interest as, to me as some of these others, but they are cool. They look more like the traditional African violets. And this is one that actually, I think I gave Blake a photo of this one. This is one we uh, received again from the Rhododendron Species Garden. Uh, and it was just labeled Jesneriaceae. We don't know what it is. Um, it might be a Briggsia or something else, which is another genus from Southeast Asia that forms these rosettes, but who knows. But it has these, looks a lot like an African violet. And I thought this thing would never be hard. It's gonna melt the first freeze we have. It was unfazed all winter long and it just finished flowering. Well, and it flowered while I was away last week on vacation, of course. But uh, yesterday there were two flowers left on it and I, one of the volunteers took a picture for me and I think I'm hoping I showed uh, it. Blake is, has or will show that. But I've been amazed with this little plant. And this brings me to the propagation on a lot of uh, other these. I mentioned earlier stem cuttings and leaf cuttings. These were some I took as, as a precaution last fall 
in, um, of leaf cuttings. I took three leaf cuttings and I got three plants. So um, I have a bunch, I could divide these up and make a, oh, there's probably 20 plantlets here now. So um, I need to pot them on. It, that is just of the briefest of overview on some of the hardy Jesneriads that we are finding we can grow here in this area. Uh, any quick questions? Uh, none right now. Okay. So, Asking with the, the one with the yellow tuber with the burgundy inside. Okay, this is Titanotrichum, mm. old hamii. And let me see, I have a label. I don't know, can we get Lise to zoom in on this label and me hold it stable enough? It learned the Latin name, it's so. It's fun to say. Titanotrichum, old hamii. So. There we go. Does that answer? Yes. Yeah, we had a question on the name of that. And uh, Marilyn just is asking, can you propagate all the Jesneriads from leaf cuttings? Not all of them. Um, I find some things will work better. If they have a stem, I do stem cuttings most of the time. I have tried C uh, Syningias as, uh, that is the, the upright ones as uh, from leaf cuttings. And I've had, I don't remember what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the, the stem ones, I, it's easy, just as easy to take a stem cutting. Uh, and the leaf, uh, some of the ones that have more rosettes that are shorter, you can do the leaves, but um, I won't guarantee all of them will do that. And I doubt things like your, the lipstick plant, this Acenanthus or whatever, or Nanthus, um, or Acenanthus, I can't spit that one out, um, would root from leaf cuttings. But, but and Hemoboea, who knows, but it's easy from division as well as uh, stem cuttings. Uh, so Valerie's asking, the syningia blooms to the tip and stops, so I cut it back. Is that Once what you should Once it's finished, do? yes. Uh, like, I deadheaded this one. This uh, syningia solovii here, um, it actually had flower stalks out to, like, here. And I cut them off, and then it branches, and you get new ones. The secondary ones typically aren't as long as the, the first ones early in the season, though. Season, though, though. Um, but... They do continue to flower for a very long time and are well worth that a little bit of deadheading. And it cleans them up easily. And if you, at that time, um, often at the base, I will cut it back to a, a branch. There's a spot right down in here. This is perfect cutting material right here. Mm. So you can take your cuttings at the same time from, uh, from your clippings when you're deadheading. Yes. So. Um, and can you give us the name of the lipstick plant again, please? Oh, okay, that one's, I can't spit that one out. That's the challenging one. <laughs> okay, uh, the lipstick plant uh, name is, I'll have to spell it. So um, A-E-S-C-H-Y-N-A-N-T-H-U-S. That's the genus, and then the species, I can say that, Buxifolius, B-U-X-I-F-O-L-I-U-S. And so um, that means boxwood leaf. So, um, but there's other species of these, uh, not all, most of them are not hardy, but you will find lipstick plants grown as house plants pretty often. I remember growing up, my aunt had some, I even killed a few, my mom I think had some, but they're one of the more common groups, so, yep. Okay, Sorry. and it looks like there are no more questions okay. in the chat, so. Thank, thank you, you for joining us, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tim, for talking about Jesneriad. Thank you all at home for joining us for this talk about Jesneriads. We got to see a lot of cool plants, a lot of cool flowers, learn some neat stuff about them. Uh, thank you so much, we'll see you all next week. Take care.